introduce myself. My name is Felicity Rite, and I teach the history of art and architecture up the hill at Marlboro College. Most of you know me because all the front row is my students. Um, <laughs> so you were in the audience too. Yeah, wow. Yes, yes, I brought the audience exactly. Um, so the, the, my, my discussion is really very different from the two presentations that have just taken place. Um, so I'll want everybody to take a minute to take your heads out of uh, southern Vermont and out of Brattleboro and think about housing more generally and more globally. Um, and and I, what, I'm, what, what I've been asked to do is to give you a sort of overview. It's the introduction to my class. So by its very nature, it's not conclusive. Um, and, I, and I'm not presenting any answers. What I'm doing is, is drawing connections between the tiny house movement um, and the larger issues of uh, housing needs across the globe. And um, I'm hoping to, I'm hoping that my students and I um, will be able to approach the tiny house movement and the aspects of the tiny house movement that I think are the most interesting and the most full of potential for develop, developing um, solutions for housing needs in a variety of different populations. And so the one example I've got up there is the ref refugee camps, um, but thinking of housing needs more broadly. Um, so the connections that, that I see are, um, are, these, are these sort of three, these are earth connections issues. The three underlying issues are the concept of housing with dignity, um, and I would define housing with dignity as using the moniker that they used in the equity solutions um, workshop yesterday, which is nothing, nothing about us without us. Um, so essentially, if you're working on uh, offering housing needs um, to, to a public, to a population, that you engage with that population in what exactly their needs are and how the, solution, how the solutions can be generated out of their creativity and their ingenuity as well. Um, as well as your own. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's a project together. And the other is aesthetics and, and quality. So, so housing somebody with dignity is housing them in something that you would live in yourself. <laughs> um, something that is beautiful because um, as many architects know, um, designs are intended, there is an aesthetic component to living well um, that isn't just living richly but, or living with money, but living you know, in a way that is satisfying to yourself. Um, and then also quality. That, that, that housing solutions should have quality uh, as, a, as a base. And I think particularly, as I'll, as I'll talk about, um, that brings up the issue of the FEMA trailers and their toxicity and the fact that they were not meant for long, as a long-term solution. But when we think about solutions to refugees, both climate refugees and war refugees, we should be thinking about them as long-term because, because by and large, we know statistically, people end up living in these places for up to seven years, sometimes for a lifetime. Um, and the other is the relationship between design, design solutions and social solutions. And what I'm tapping into there is um, design thinking. And for those of you who don't know about design thinking in the class, you will learn about it. Um, for those of you who do, I think it's a, it's, IDEO is the, is the company that sort of coined the term of design thinking. But it's essentially a way of using design to come up to, to solve social problems that, that create the way creative um, the creative mind works can actually be focused on social problems. And the last is community, that, that a tiny home is successful because the person living in it has a community that sustains and supports them. Um, and, and we, I think one, one of the things about the tiny home movement that I think is a question is this idea about the sort of lone individual taking their home on the road, so to speak. Um, but, but in fact, building a tiny home, sustaining a tiny home, putting a tiny home on a lot, all of these things involve engagement with other people. So at the base of, of all housing issues is, is the idea of a strong community. Um, so I'm just going to run through, uh, and I'm sorry for the, you can't read this, but, but you, I'll, I'll zoom in, um, the, the, the history, because it's really important to recognize that the tiny house movement is really just one in a long series of um, small home solutions. Um, and many of those small home solutions have been um, de demonstrations of the need by, or the, de or the desire by both governments and people to house people in need. Um, and so one of the best examples are the little cottages that were built after the earthquake in San Francisco in 1906. Um, they had originally housed 
um, housed people made house homeless by the earthquake and the fire in these uh, in tents in Presidio and, and these other other big public parks. And then they discovered that people didn't have the wherewithal to get out of the tents and out of the parks. So they did this business of designing these little cottages that people could live in. They built them, or they got the people to help them build them in the parks. And as people reestablished themselves, got their feet back under them, you could buy one of these cottages, you could move it out of the park to the plot of land that you had purchased. And so it was a, a government-run system that enabled people to attain their, to rebuild after, after the earthquake. So it got rid of all the debris of, um, of a refugee camp because the people took the houses with them. Uh, it cleared the park, and of course, it's, it's tiny living. And you can see, and, and some of these cottages that were built in 1906 are still being used. The two there are, oops, sorry. Um, the two there are, are in, in the public park, Presidio Park, as a sort of um, examples. Um, and over the course of the, in, 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 from the 1920s up until the beginning of World War II, there was a recognized need on the, on behalf, on the part of architects and designers to provide affordable housing. This was a conscious recognition, this was important. Um, and so one of, the, one of the sort of more ingenious designs was our book, Minister Fuller's Dimaxion House, which was designed to be accessible um, to, for purchase uh, and, and move to wherever you need. They were essentially sort of do-it-yourself, build your own home. Um, and, and you could get one for the almost the price of a car, a high-end car, but essentially a car. Um, and these were unfortunately designed in 1920, not built until 1945. Um, and they, the ones that were built still are, are still in good shape, but they did not end up being mass marketed. What ended up being mass marketed was the mobile home, which developed around the same time period. Um, First, the, 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 um, the Lustrin and the Durham portable houses were essentially housing kits that were, that were moved from place to place and a, and, and a reasonably educated person could put them together. Um, they were superseded by the mobile home where you actually already completed the structure that was brought and put in place. Um, in, in the midst of this um, transfer or, or engagement by, on the behalf of architects and uh, industry, to find ways in which you could house people afford affordable, World War II happened. And World War II is, is, in terms of refugee practice and housing practice, was a major watershed. Um, not only were enormous amounts of housing stock destroyed by the war, but also millions of people were uh, set in motion um, and moving from place to place. The UNHCR, the UN High Commission on Refugees, was established um, in the 1950s, post or, or right, right after World War II, in order to deal with the millions of people who had been displaced, figuring out how to house them, and also figuring out how to resettle them. Um, and then there was also the sort of modernist architectural movement to address rebuilding um, and rebuilding quickly and making these these. Re structures accessible. So designs like Le Corbusier's Maison Le Domino um, were, were sort of being investigated to figure out how you could house people and make it affordable. Um, and and un unfortunately, this predictable trajectory uh, ended poorly, <laughs> um, although it's still sort of going on. And, and the example of this, if, if you know anything about the history of modern architecture, the um, best example is the pruitt Igo public housing um, uh, set of buildings, 30, 30 high-rise structures that were built outside of St. Louis, um, designed by Yamasaki, interestingly enough, the same man who designed the World Trade Centers. Um, uh, and and they, the whole idea behind them was the idea of integrated housing, um, creating affordable units, making them, unfortunately, they were cookie cutter, so the modernist idea of functionality. Um, but and, and things like elevators that only went, went up uh, two floors at a time instead of stopping at every single floor, which, is, which was an energy saving device, but turned out also to be a real trial for people who lived in the in-between floors. Um, and there were various other problems um, with the housing. One of them was, was uh, integration. Um, that this was designed to be a multicultural, multiracial unit, but in fact what ended up because of laws in St. Louis of black people and white people not being able to inhabit the same spaces, um, that, that, the, that the apartments got occupied um, in, in a variety of different ways, one of which was um, they turned into essentially to slum dwellings. So in, in the end, they were actually destroyed, um, demolished in 1972, um, because they had turned into uh, 
pockets of, of drugs and poverty and crime. Um, and so, so this is this is one of the one of the problems with thinking about modernism and modern architecture and modern architectural solutions as housing solutions. Um, for, there's an ongoing debate about why Pruitt Igo failed. Many people believe it's modernism that people don't like these sort of cookie cutter homes, and that's certainly an issue worth debate. But the other issue, of course, is important: is the segregation laws um, and redlining and all the sort of idea around race and poverty um, and the structural problems in our society that, that it, it stopped people, the people who owned these things, investing money in them to keep them up so the people who were living them were slowly living in places that were declining in quality. Um, and, and, and I think anybody who's lived in a, in a substandard home knows how hard it is to maintain it um, and to maintain a good, a good sense about it as it falls apart around your ears. Um, so, so that's sort of a, a snapshot of the, of the past. And in the present, interestingly enough, um, I was just thinking about this this morning, we, we've sort of had all of the problems of the 20th century in the last 17 years, sort of on steroids. Um, so we've had, you know, the for, foreclosure market of, of the, when, when um, the economy went south in 2007 is very similar to the Great Depression, the number of people who lost their homes um, and were made homeless, not equivalent number-wise, but, but in terms of mentality-wise. And of course, environmental degradation, environmental disaster, what we're experiencing outside is a fraction of obviously what they experienced in Houston, but this is Harvey. I gather that this is Harvey heading is our, our way. So, um, and we all know the slide over there with Time Magazine is, is Houston last week. Um, so, so environmental disasters are continuing. The Syrian civil war is continuing. Um, the, the economic uh, issues that are causing people to get in boats and cross the Mediterranean to look for a better uh, life are continuing. Um, and all of these issues are, uh, is for, the purpose of this class, our investigation, really surrounded around housing. Um, and one of my particular interests is refugee housing and refugee camps. Um, and so I'm just going to show you a couple of images of that. This is the, this, I hope, I hope you can all see this. I don't know if any of you get the New York Times and followed this story. This is the, um, the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan. Um, and this is when the camp opened. This is a Google view, obviously, of when the camp opened in September 3rd, 2012. And you can see that's the section of it right there. This is what it looked like in 2014. The camp is still open. There are 75,000 Syrians who live there. Um, and, and it certainly shows it's not, it's not going to close anytime soon. Um, and, and you can see that it's, it, 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 it's, it's, it's built like a camp. Um, but the people who are living there and being born there um, because now, of course, it's been open for, for five years, so people are being born and people are dying and people are living their lives in this place. Um, it has a lot to do with the way people think about themselves and think about their mentality. And another, the reason why it connects to us, it connects to us, these are human beings, but it also connects because we know that for, for Syrian refugees to come to this country, they have to go through an examination process. That examination process takes a thousand days. That's three years. So you're spending three years of your life in this place in the outside chance that you then end up in the United States. Now, of course, all of that's been suspended. So people are, people are, and this is, this is just one I'm, I'm particularly, I mean, obviously adults are important, but also children are extremely important, probably more so because their consciousness and their life, it, a, a lot of it has to do with how they're, the environment that they live in, the environment that they grow up in. So this is just kids playing computer games. And, and, and for those of you who are aesthetically inclined and design inclined, you can reimagine those spaces fairly easily and turn them into nicer spaces. Um, and, that, and that's the whole point, I think, of our course, is to take the innovative ideas that are coming out of tiny homes and think about refugee camps differently, think about um, itinerant housing differently. And this is just my personal experience. Um, I volunteered two years running in uh, the Karatepe refugee camp in Lesbos, Greece, um, during, the, during the ongoing crisis there. And this is so another Google view. This is Karatepe before the crisis. This is midway through the crisis. That's a new refugee camp that has developed um, there. Again, those people are all still living there. They've moved from tents to pods to um, those trailers relatively like FEMA trailers um, that they're now living in. And, and there's no sign that they're moving anywhere from, from there. 
Um, another really important issue is here in the United States. Um, really important, I think, to recognize uh, the difference between between what we've done in the past and what we're doing currently. Um, so just some statistics about Katrina. Of course, Katrina is still very much with us. The after effects of Katrina are extremely important. And I think this is one of the more interesting issues. Um, total damages from Katrina, 135 billion. Um, and the federal spending, 120.5 uh, billion, 75 of which was just emergency relief. So if you think about rebuilding and reestablishing and, and, and funneling money into infrastructure, that was not where the lion's share of the money was spent. And so that's, that may account for this statistic, that it, in, in um, 2015, only 80% of the New Orleans population had reestablished themselves. Um, and this is a really interesting, which my students will spend much more time looking at. Somebody's done the research to demonstrate before Katrina and after Katrina. So again, 2015, um, in the neighborhood of the estates, there was um, 1,860 units, public housing, uh, that's 285. Um, so now, in 2015, there's only 285 units in the same place. Um, so you can imagine that's probably one of the reasons accounts for this statistic, that, that there's no places for these people to move back to um, yet. And, and, and the, the other issue, which again is a sort of open question, is the FEMA trailer, the toxic FEMA trailers, the 120,000 trailers that FEMA purchased um, to put people in after uh, Katrina that were turned out to have toxic levels of formaldehyde in them, and there was a class action suit. Um, this is one of them in, uh, in um, New Orleans. The, this is a group of them in North Dakota in 2011, the class action suit that had forced the, the federal government to retain these trailers um, ended, and so the government sell, sold them off. And they were supposed to, they were all marked not for housing, but those, those labels were taken off. And they have found themselves, they are, they are all over. Now there's an there's a interesting research that's been done on tracking these trailers. Um, and they continue to be toxic, um, but they, they are used again for housing. So this is another one of these implications of thinking about how we house people and how we meet their needs, that if we produce, it's an actually interesting sort of systems thinking approach, if we produce something that's toxic, um, that toxicity can sort of goes into the system and then pervades. Am I am I done? Am I, oh, okay. Um, oh, so there, so there, there's the detail. There you can see. Oh, 283. I remembered it wrong. Um, and so one of the one of the features um, of this class is is and not not a big focus, but a really important focus is, is the economy in relationship to why this is happening. Um, and for those of you who study economics and political science, you know the concept of neoliberalism and what, and, and certainly there's a, there's a, there, neoliberalism has a lot to do um, with where, where we are today and why we're here. And, and one of the aspects of neoliberalism is the relationship between housing as a right and housing as a commodity. And the neoliberal economy introduces the concept of housing as a commodity. So essentially, if you can afford it, you can have it. You can have lots of it. But if you can't, you can't, you can't. Um, and as and I think the history of the 20th century demonstrates that in fact in the United States and in many parts of the world, we have for the most part thought of it as a right and thought that, when, that we, have a, we have a responsibility to ourselves and our communities to house people who need housing. Um, but now that's a question, and it's a, it's a point that's debated. So that is, is an important, I think it's a really important issue that we have to bring to the fore and talk about. Because until we address how we believe about housing, we're not actually going to solve any of these problems. Um, and this is a global problem. This is not just, the, the, so, so these are wealth uh, charts that as a non economist, I'm not going to be able to say their truth but, but, the, but, or their accuracy. but, but they seem to come, they've created Suisse, um, so they, they come from fairly reputable sources. And it demonstrates that essentially um, what was talked about in yesterday's session, the, the equity solutions, that the, the world's wealth is, is migrating towards fewer and fewer people. Um, and if alongside that you have a perception or a belief that housing is a commodity, then what's going to happen is the housing is going to also migrate um, away from, from people to people who, from the people who need it to the people who can afford it. Um, and, and another aspect, 
just to make, I mean, this is a 14-week course, and there's lots going on in it. Um, another aspect is, is urbanism, that, that um, tiny, tiny, home, tiny homes are not, just about, are not just about rural populations, they're also about cities, particularly American cities, which are very spread out, probably less possible in, in European cities, which are very dense, densely built up. Um, but it's really important to recognize that the trend that we're dealing with globally is that more and more people are moving towards cities, and that as more and more people move towards cities, with the economy the way, going the way the economy is going, more and more of those people are actually living in substandard housing. Um, so right now, over half of the population of the globe lives in a city. Um, by 20, whatever you can read that, 2050, 60, it'll be 66%, so this is a trend that's going towards urban living. Um, and the, the slide over here on the right, that's, that is um, uh, Mumbai in, in India, and um, ha a, little, a little over half, or a little under half of the population of Mumbai lives in a slum. So, so that, that's as the slums are getting bigger and bigger, the cities are getting bidding, bigger and bigger, and slum, slum living is really substandard living, and it also is living, um, and by its definition, it's you don't own the land that you're living on, which means you're not building any equity. Um, so you're not, what you, what you, you don't own anything, so you, those, those, those non-possessions can't appreciate, essentially. So if you're living in a slum, a slum it's very hard to get yourself out of a slum. Um, so, so the ha you know the happiness note or the hopeful note um, are is is this relationship between design innovation and and social innovation that, that we can there are the solutions are out there and you can see from the wealth um, charts that there's plenty of wealth to to make these solutions all happen um, and and some of the components of the tiny house fest one of them being the do it yourself get your community together, make things happen, um, is an important part of these solutions. Another is, um, this is the new urban mechanics office in, the, in the, the, the mayor's office in Boston. I don't know if anybody knows about this, but this is a super interesting um, office that is in working in Boston, and essentially they're using a design thinking um, uh, structure to figure out how to solve all sorts of issues within the Boston area. And one of the in interesting ones in relationship to tiny homes is recognizing that a 400 or a, an 800 square foot apartment, which was the basic apartment or housing unit in Boston, was more than most people could afford. And so they constructed a, um, a mock-up of a 385 square foot apartment. And they took it on the road around Boston and the greater Boston area to let people get in it and see what it was like to live in 385 square feet. And they got all sorts of community comments back. And, the, and, and because of that, they decided to commission a, 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 a complex with these kinds of units in it that are, that are way more affordable with the community recognizing what they were getting themselves into by buying into a that sort of a unit. So that's a very in, in, innovative and interesting project that's going on. There are a variety of other small or, or um, NGO-oriented projects that are going on. Dignity Village in Portland, Oregon, um, that was zoned, we were talking about this yesterday, zoned as a campground to enable homeless people to construct their own homes um, and to use the community and community resources to sort of keep on recycling those homes, give people uh, places to live. Um, uh, Potter's, uh, Potter's Lane in California is uh, the, um, a company that, that donated um, containers to be built to create apartment buildings for homeless vets that were then built and constructed um, using donated materials and donated time from a variety of different volunteers. Similar project that happened spontaneously in Bristol and England where a homeless man and, a, and um, a volunteer got together to get a container and then refashion it so the homeless man could have a place to live. Um, design ideas like um, the super adobe structure, which are very easy to build and have been used in the 1990s in, um, in a, the, a refugee camp in Iran. So basically using the materials that are there on site and, and allowing the people who are living in the camp to participate in constructing their own homes. Um, and this one, which, so just going from, from a, a mayor's office government structure all the way across the spectrum to individuals 
this, the Office of Displaced Designers, is a, was a, is a very small NGO that was started by um, a, a, a woman from London who actually worked alongside me in um, Karatepe in 2015, a designer and architect who decided her experience of being in the, in the refugee camp and how to help and how to use her skills to help. She, she and, a, and another colleague um, started the Office of Displaced Designers, which essentially uses the skills and capacities and needs of refugees in the camp to figure out how to create design solutions to, to build things for to suit their needs. So they have a variety of different projects. And if anybody wants to volunteer, they'll take volunteers. You fly, you have to fly on your own over to Greece, um, but they'll put you up and you can offer your expertise to the refugees in Lesbos, which of course they will appreciate. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that they recognized they needed was some kind of public space outside of the Moria refugee camp. And in Lesbos, they, they have one great thing about the refugee camps in Lesbos is that is the people who live there are not forced to stay there. They are, have free reign of the island. They can go in and out of the camp. Um, so they built um, a, an outdoor cinema um, outside of the Moria refugee camp. And Moria, there are, two, there are two refugee camps in Lesbos. Moria is the more distressing one. It was its prison that was repurposed as a refugee camp. So you can imagine concrete walls and barbed wire. And it is the place where everybody who lands in Lesbos now is required to go and spend, I believe, 25 days. So children, Every, everybody has to go there into a prison. Um, and so these, these guys got together and the picture up in upper right is them planning and designing and then you can see they built the theater and I'm sorry that I can't deal in. I've got one minute, I'm done. Actually, it's my last thought. Yeah, one minute. <laughs>